We are going to finish, as Nikki said, our series in Jonah. And so if you've got a Bible, would you like to turn to Jonah chapter 3, or if you want to look it up on your phone, or the verses will come up on the screen. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. And by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. I want to talk to you today about when you say yes to God. Just think, what could happen if you say yes to God? Now, if you're anything like me or anything like Jonah, there's often a bit of a battle when it comes to saying yes to God. Now, just to say right at the start, I don't instantly feel like I am much like Jonah. I don't really feel like I can relate to him. There's that whole being in the belly of a fish thing. I don't really relate to that so much. And I don't know about you, but Sometimes when I read through the Bible, I read through stories, there are some people that I resonate with. There are some people that I relate to. I think, oh yeah, I can see something of me in this particular person, this particular character. Um, and Jonah's not one of them. For me, I would think of somebody like um, Ruth, say, in the Old Testament, known for her faithfulness. Um, or someone like uh, Mary in the New Testament, who sat at the feet of Jesus, in a posture of devotion, listening to his every word. Now, I think, you know, people like that, that's who I feel like I can relate to. <laughs> Reading through the four chapters of the book, I think Jonah comes across as, he comes across as stubborn, as someone who's blatantly disobedient to God. He thinks he knows best. He's not exactly a yes man. He gets cross with God. He moans and he gets sulky. It's just not me. It's just, I'm just not like that. Although, the more I look into the story, the more I understand that there may, may, there may be some similarities that I possibly missed on first glance of the story. Like Jonah, I felt God was calling me to speak. And Jonah was called to speak to the wicked Ninevites in the city. And my call, I felt God was calling me to speak and teach in the context of church. So that's different in that sense. But like Jonah, I battled with it. Two, two weeks ago, we read in Jonah chapter 1, effectively, that he said no to God. It was a battle. He said no first time round, and then he ran in the opposite direction. And some years ago, I felt like God said to me, if I'm asked to speak in church, um, you're to, I'm to say yes. And I said to God, no. No, I don't, I don't want to do that because I don't think I'll be very good. And I felt like the Lord said to me, I'm not asking you to be good. I'm asking you to be faithful. I didn't want to speak because I was fearful about the reaction from other people. Jonah didn't want to speak because he was fearful about the reaction from God. You see, the Ninevites were wicked people. They were a massive threat to Israel. In fact, Jonah's prophetic contemporaries, Hosea and Amos, were at the time busy prophesying, saying, Israel, unless you turn from your ways and you turn back to God, then you're going to fall at the hands of the Assyrians, of which Nineveh was their capital city. So Jonah, being an Israelite, didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go with God's message. Not because he was afraid of what the Ninevites might do to him, but because he was afraid of what God might do if he gave his message and they responded. Because he knew God. He knew that God was kind. He knew that God was compassionate. So he was worried, actually, thinking, if I give this message and they repent, they're still going to stay here. 
whereas he wanted God to destroy them. He wanted to rule out them being a threat to Israel anymore. Like Jonah, my reluctance to speak is rooted in two things. And the first one is control. It's the battle of the will. Lord, I think I've got a better idea of what I should be doing with my life than you. You know, I think I've got some thoughts and plans. How about you just want to have a little listen to those? Oh, and the second one is fear, a battle of the heart. Do I trust God? When I feel like God is calling me to something, do I trust that he's good, that he's kind, that he's going to provide, that he's going to empower me and equip me with the things that he's calling me to do? A battle of the heart, do I trust him? Now, I like to be organized. I like to be tidy. I like shoes in the shoe basket. I like coats in the coat cupboard. Um, I like a place for everything and everything in its place. Um, I'm a working mum, my husband and I, Martin, we've got four sons in three different schools. They have at least 10 sports fixtures every week, and that's not including school ones. So I've got a busy diary, a busy washing machine. I'm for, I forever shopping and, and cooking and feeding these growing, hungry, sporty lads. I love lists. I rely on them to be able to get through my day and my week. I need to be organized. I love to be prepared. I love efficiency. I love to be in control. I love that sense of being in control control of my life. But at the beginning of this year, I actually started feeling a bit out of control. And there was no one thing in my circumstances. There was no one sort of situation that changed things. Christmas had been busy, but it's always busy. And I was definitely ready for um, a break. I was ready for a few days. Maybe I just thought, if I just get out of London go to the countryside or go to the sea, something like that. And we never really managed to get around to doing that. And I think I started the, low, I started the year feeling quite low. And I'm not someone who's usually um, suffered with January blues. And I'm not someone who's sort of, sort of suffered up and down. I think emotionally I'm quite sort of stable. Um, but yeah, I just found myself in a place where I almost didn't recognize myself because I was struggling so much with a sense of, what have I got to bring? What have I got to bring? I would look around me at people and see how they were just doing life and seem to be knocking it out of the park. I just think, I don't feel like I'm doing anything very well. I think I'm doing lots of things and none of it very well. What have I got to bring? And I, was, I was genuinely really struggling with a, with a sense of worthlessness. I know that sounds a bit melodramatic. It sounds like I'm having a massive counselling session right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It's, it's, it just, do you know what I mean? It just really helps to get it off my chest. <laughs> but I was feeling, I was feeling a sense of, um, a sort of emotional isolation, of being quite detached from people, like the lights are on but no one's at home, that kind of thing, and my confidence just hit rock bottom. And so the thought of doing anything up front, whether it was with our staff team or at church on a Sunday, the thought of doing anything up front, I just, it filled me with dread. Because I just thought, I've got nothing to say, I've got nothing to bring, Lord, I'm, I'm all out. And so I began to say to myself and to the Lord, I don't want to do anything up front anymore. You know, I know I've said yes about things, now I'm saying no. And um, you just I just don't want to do it. I feel too vulnerable and it's too costly. It's going to cost me too much. And then one day I received an email from Archie Coates, who along with his wife Sam leads St. Peter's Church in Brighton. And together they oversee the HTB family um, group of churches. And uh, he was emailing me, asking if I would do a short devotional talk um, at a retreat for our city centre church plant um, leaders. I just thought, I just got cross with God. <laughs> Bill like Jonah, <laughs> again. I just got cross with him. I thought, you know, you know how I'm feeling. You know that I'm really struggling. This isn't normal for me. Normally I'm like, yeah, you know, crack on, let's get on with it. I'm at a real low point and you're asking me to do something and I've told you I don't want to do it. Moni, <laughs> having a strop. Um, it took me two days to work out how I could email him back to say um, no. And I couldn't really think of a way of wording it without me looking a complete idiot. So, and I felt the Lord actually say, Emily, I want you to say yes. I want you to say yes to this. So I said yes. And I did it, not because I wanted to and not because I felt like it, because I knew I had a choice. I knew I had a choice to either obey God or not. And the thing is, I had to trust then, Lord, if you're asking me to do this, I'm going to trust that you're not going to, you're not going to let me down. You're going to help me. You're going to help me with this. You know what's best for me. 
I just wonder, what is God calling you to today? What is he calling you to? What is he asking you for your yes on? Maybe it's speaking to a friend about Jesus or a colleague or a family member. Maybe he's wanting you to start up Alpha in your workplace. Maybe it's to write that book. Or maybe it's to take that course or to serve on the HTB kids team. Maybe it's a calling to ordination. Maybe it's to say yes to God, a relationship with yes to God today. That's the best yes that you could ever give is saying yes to a relationship with Jesus. What's stopping you from saying yes? Is there an element of control or fear that you're battling with? Are you weighing up the cost? And it seems that it really cost Jonah to say yes to God. But in verse one, it says that God gave him a second chance and he took it. And my experience of stepping out and saying yes to God, that felt really costly to me. But ultimately, in saying yes to God, I experienced just a real deep down freedom when I'd said yes to God and I sort of stepped out. It's like, I trust you. I, ex- I experienced a real inner freedom inside. And, and more than that, actually, a new courage as well to not shrink back, but to keep saying yes to God. And a few weeks ago, um, I was after having sort of stepped out and said yes to God, like, right. Because I, before, you see, I was saying, I don't want to say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lead services. I would try and find ways of telling other people that they could do it and get myself off the rotor and things like that. And so after I'd said this initial yes, and I was down to lead a service, and I was there, and I, I was in the worship time, and I remember I had this picture in my mind of like an old statue covered in cobwebs. And I, a thought came to my mind, I wonder if there's somebody here who used to go to church a long time ago but hasn't been for years, long time, maybe even years. And I thought, oh Lord, is that you speaking? Are you wanting me to, to say this, to share this word? So just after the worship, I got up and, and I often feel like it's quite costly to give a word. You think, I wonder if God might be saying this. Um, because if it's wrong, then you could look an idiot. People just go, she got it wrong. So I often feel like it'd be quite costly. But I thought, no, I'm gonna give it anyway. I've got this new courage. I want to be obedient. I want to say yes to God when he's asking me to speak. So I gave the word. And even before I'd finished, this lady appeared right at the front. She'd come right down the aisle and she stood there right in front of me. And I, and I said to her, and she said, that, she said, that's me, that's me. And I said to her, it's cost you a lot to come here today, hasn't it? And she nodded. And I said, and the thing is, I feel like God is wanting to say to you, welcome home. And then the whole place erupted in applause. It was like the church was wanting to clap as if to say, welcome home, welcome home. And at that point, I didn't know her backstory. And I found out afterwards that she had arrived that day as someone suffering with incredible social anxiety, um, pretty much trapped in her home because of fear and anxiety. And there was something in her, something that prompted her to come to church. So she turned up at the start of the service, asked to speak to a pastor, and the pastor at that service said, if you feel like you can, stay for the service. And of course, if you're struggling with social anxiety, being in a room with hundreds of people is a really hard thing to do. But she stayed, and then of course I gave that word that I felt like the Lord may or may not be speaking to somebody about. And there she was, she responded. Somebody who'd been pretty much trapped in her home came out of her seat, out of the row, down the middle of the aisle, in front of everyone on the floor, in front of everyone in the balconies, to respond to God. I thought it was costly for me to speak and give this word, but really, it was costly for her. But because I'd stepped out in a little bit of freedom, actually, she found this, ma- this new level of freedom. And it was like God was saying to her, welcome home, this is where you belong. She was trapped in her home, this is her home, in the church, in the family, in a community, this is where you belong, in a place of freedom. Saying yes to God is never solely about just you or I experiencing freedom. When you say yes to God, you find yourself in the middle of his work, 
And sometimes you'll say yes to God and you have no idea what's going on around you, but your obedience, you find yourself in the middle of God being at work. Obedience leads to blessing. And for Jonah, the cost of obedience was actually the catalyst for revival. That's what happened in this passage. Jonah's route from Joppa to Nineveh was about 550 miles, which would have taken him roughly 40 days, 40 days walking with God and wrestling with his agenda. Now, in the Bible, 40 often signifies a period or a time of testing, then followed by a blessing or a breakthrough. If you think about Noah and the flood, 40 days, 40 nights. If you think about um, the Israelites wandering around the desert in Exodus. Uh, If you think about Jesus tested for 40 days in the wilderness before he began his preaching ministry, his speaking ministry. Maybe in this 40-day period of Lent, you've given up something. Maybe you've given up chocolate or social media or Netflix or coffee or whatever it might be. Let me encourage you, this might be a time of testing, but in 40 days' time, there's going to be blessing. There's going to be a breakthrough as a result. And for Jonah, he was walking 40 days, and then he delivers this message. He preaches a fairly half-hearted, short and not very sweet message to the city. He says these, there are only eight words, five in Hebrew, and they were 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the city responded. They repented. It says from the greatest to the least, from the king to the cattle even. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had relented, or as some translations put it, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he threatened. Do you know, it turns out that Jonah was the most successful prophet in the whole of the Bible. He was the only person in scripture that people listened to and then responded to his words. And the irony is, he's the one who really wished that they hadn't, because he would rather the Lord have just smited them. But his prophecy was fulfilled, but not in the way that he was expecting. Because the word overthrow in Hebrew has like a double meaning to it. It can either be overthrown, as in taken over, destroyed, that kind of thing. Or it could be overthrown, change of heart, turn around, repentant. And that's what the entire city did. It says in verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. See, Jonah's responsibility wasn't the outcome. His responsibility was to be obedient. His responsibility was just to say yes. What is it that God is asking you to say yes to today? You know, yes is a small word, but it has a big impact. It was one man, one message, one day, and a city was saved. Not because of Jonah, but because of God. It certainly wasn't the power of personality on display, but it was God's power made perfect in weakness. It wasn't Jonah's message, it was God's. And the thing is, when God speaks, things happen. When God speaks, things happen. God spoke and so began the work of creation. God spoke and he calmed the storm. God spoke and he healed. God spoke and he delivered. People were set free. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, it says, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Jonah said yes to God, and he himself turned around, which resulted in the turnaround of an entire city. And the story of Jonah shows us how one person's course in life can impact the course of history. That's the power of yes. The greatest example of this, though, is in Jesus. Having mercy and compassion on us, God sent the word in form of a man, and Jesus said yes. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He was obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the ultimate turnaround was the resurrection when he rose from the grave, came back to life. And in doing so, it meant that not just one city, but every nation, everyone might hear the message of the cross and how God loved them, knowing that God loved them. And what strikes me in this story of Jonah is the urgency bit. 
and, and the, immediate, the immediacy with which the Ninevites responded. It says in verse 8, let everyone call urgently on God. It seems that God was already at work in the city, laying down the foundations of the court of repentance. Now, historical records show that there were two severe plagues that happened in Nineveh around that time. And also, there was a solar eclipse, which to the Ninevites, they attributed to deity. So they felt like God was at work, just what was going on in their nation. And then Jonah turns up, one man, one message, one day, and they were ripe and ready for repentance. What happens when you say yes to God? Jonah's message was a catalyst for a national conversion on a previously unheard scale. I believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in our city. As Nikki said, we had an increase of 40% of people attending at Alpha at Autumn. An increase of 400 people on our Sunday, our Sunday services. That's like two large churches happening right under our very nose. This, and the Holy Spirit is at work across our nation. In our HTB family alone, since September, we've celebrated church plants in Southampton, in Bristol, in Swindon, in Andover, and soon in Preston as well. And sometimes it's hard for us to see what God is doing when you're at one service on one site on a Sunday. And that's one of the things I love about focus, actually, is that we all get together. We get to see and we get to celebrate what God is doing in our nation, calling people to himself, growing the church. We see what God is doing. And I, I just have this sense that we are on an approach to a tipping point in our nation, in a spiritual sense. And I don't, we're not there yet, but I just sense that God is at work and we're on approach to a tipping point. And I just think, might we dare to believe that God might want to use us if we lay down our own agendas, our own ideas, all the stuff that we just think we might want to do with our lives and say to God, not my will, but your will be done. Could our yes be the catalyst for a national conversion on a previously unheard scale. It happened before. Nothing is impossible with God. Could it happen again? The book of Jonah is about grace. He uses imperfect, stubborn, strong-willed, fear-filled people to bring about his purposes. And he says to us all, I'm not asking you to be good. I'm not asking you to be successful. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm not asking you to have it all together. I'm not asking you when you get to a certain place of achievement or standard or age or whatever it might be. I'm just asking you to be faithful and I'm asking you to be obedient. I wonder what could happen if you said yes to God today.